Okay, let us complete our survey of Cesare Foligno's The Transmission of the Legacy, the legacy being that of Rome. Papal support was freely given to Pepin and Charlemagne and would be grievously misunderstood if it were too held to imply that uh, Carlovingian revival of learning took place under Italian influence. So we're in the courts of Charlemagne. The Frankish court, where men were assembled from all parts of the West, Italians were few. They remained for short periods and were entrusted with comparatively unimportant duties. Only Paulus Diaconus, Peter of Pisa, and Paulinus of Aquileia represented Italian thought in the circle of Charlemagne. And they were summoned to it long after the beginning of its educational reform. Not in Italy that Charlemagne had met his principal advisor, but he was not an Italian. In the year 781, at Parma, the king came across Alcuin and was so favorably impressed with him that the scholar was thereafter attacked, uh, attached to the court and was never followed to leave it for long. Notker, the monk of St. Gaul, did not think of Alcuin and may have rather exaggerated his description when he wrote the two Scots on landing in Gaul shouted to the crowd, if there is any one among you who wishes to acquire wisdom, let him come to us and he will get it, for we have it for sale. It is for certain, however, that Charlemagne's educational activities were influenced by Irish and Anglo-Saxon tendencies in learning, and among the men who were entrusted with the more delicate duties were Alcuin and his friends, Wizzo, Fredugus, Dickwill, Egenhard, Clemens Scotus, Josephus Scotus, and Smaragdus. And just as their treatises were Celtic in type, the best Latin poets at court were the Frank, Engelbert, and Alcuin himself. So, trying to add some flavor to the characters surrounding Charlemagne's court, getting to the bones of to what extent was Charlemagne's court really a revival in Roman uh, ruling or Roman legacy? Um, was he aping something that by the 8th century had vanished, you know, could, could Charlemagne ever have re really recaptured the spirit of Rome? Men like Alcuin would have been important to that, um, so we'll see what Cesare has to say further. But whatever, continues Cesare, their immediate origin, their learning was profoundly Latin. Alcuin's treatises are based on Donatus Cicero's De Invitione, Porphyrius's introduction in Aristotle's categories, and his poems are not so. These are people who uh, would have done gone through the natural transmission rather than the artificial transmission, right? So the fact of being discussed in eighth century Charlemagne uh, court, Carlovingian court, is 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 a case in point that they are not the natural transmission that they went through the dark age rather than reemerged in the Renaissance as an artificial tra uh, tradition or transmission. So Cicero uh, largely, his, his De Inventione anyway, is natural. Uh, a lot of Aristotle's categories and, and basic logic, you know, this was going to feed in to what becomes the Organon later. This is uh, natural, of course. It has to emerge as the scholastic stuff in the 12th and 13th centuries. But um, to do so, it had to have gone through this mutation in, the Char in Charlemagne's court. Frequent imitations of Virgil, Luke, and Statius, Fortunatus, they retain, however, sufficiently individuality not to be comparable to the usual cantones of the Middle Ages. Creative power was not stunted in them by servile imitation, and the verses de Cuculo and the conflictus veris et hiemis are charming little poems. Egenhardt's Vita Caroli was cast in the mold of Suetonius's Life of Augustus. The palaces of Worms, Ingelheim, Nimwegen, and Ace la Chapelle were decorated with statues and precious marbles which had been removed from Ravenna and Rome, and were probably built after the designs of Egenhart, a man who seems to have possessed all gifts and was a close student of Vitruvius. So we still have Vitruvius in the architectural sphere coming from Rome as an influence. Further, the writing and illuminating of manuscripts reached in the days of Charlemagne is a very high standard of clearness and neatness, but both handwriting and illuminations reveal Anglo-Saxon influence. So again, this is uh, tying in with what Hyatt would have said, that uh, the Dark Ages really belong, in a classical traditional sense, to England, 
that even the great empire of Charlemagne takes on people like Alcuin of York and has an Anglo-Saxon uh, tradition in its illuminations of its own manuscripts. And during the 8th century, Latinity went back to Gaul through Britain. Charlemagne's scheme, so similar how Greek was retained in Ireland, uh, g- genuine Latinity was maintained in Britain and went back into to Gaul into the mainland after the disruptions of the, the darkest points of the Dark Age. Charlemagne's, now there will be a later darkness for England, um, not coming from the ruptures that dismantled Rome, but coming from the Norsemen. The Vikings. That will plunge England into another Dark Age, but it will have revitalized in, in France for the Middle Ages, for the early Middle Ages. Uh, and hence, hence why chapter three of Hyatt becomes about France in the Middle Ages and abandons England until until we get to Chaucer. So, Charlemagne's schemes of educational reform are not allowed to lapse by his sons and successors. It was during their rule that Italy was struck by the tide which had first started from Rome, spreading through the Western Empire and later had flowed back from Ireland to Northumberland and Northumberland and Ireland to the Carolingian Kingdom. So the process that we talked about there. The delay must be accounted for by political conditions and by the fact that Italian activities seemed to centre on trade and later on building when means were provided for it by the pence uh, of a growing number of pilgrims. Schools were established or reformed. Irish monks formed centres of teaching at Bobbio, Pavia and Venetia, in Piedmont and Emilia, at Nonantola in Tuscany and at Farfa, and more particularly at Monte Cassino. Monte Cassino being the... Um, reclusive uh, foundation of of Boethius's friend Cassiodorus. An unknown Irishman copied works of Horace Ovid, St. Augustine and Bede at Milan and his manuscript is still extant. Marcus Eberhard of Friuli had in his library of works of religion and writings of Pagetius, Orosius, Orosius being a writer that uh, Alfred the Great admired and translated. Fulgentius, Sedulius, Alcuin, and Smaragdus. There is evidence that almost everywhere libraries were put together at this time. Donatus Scotus, who became Bishop of Florence, is supposed to have explained to his pupil not only Virgil, but also portions of Hesiod and uh, Democritus, coming from Greece and the Alexandrian Age. At Naples, Lothar II is said to have met 32 philosophers the value of whose theories, it is probably merciful that we are unable to judge. Progress was stunted once more during the 10th century and a period of decadence followed. Interesting point uh, by Cesare that that he reckons what actually incurred was not the lapse to the Dark Ages of the incursion of Vikings and the Normans. As he says here, the onslaught of Arabs, Normans, and Slabs brought confusion and destruction everywhere, breaking up of the Carlovingian Empire, and the struggles in Britain and Italy caused learning to fall into abeyance. It's interesting that he points towards a decadence in the court of, of Charlemagne. It's not simply an incursion. I would probably say more it was an incursion into a fledgling revival. You know, it was a revival which didn't which hadn't fully flowered, and so it was susceptible to attack. But Cesare, by using the word decadence, I think it's quite an interesting choice. It's an interesting phrase choice that he is already thinking of this mode of every every flourishing has its decadence um, rather than it being nipped in the bud, so to speak. But towards the end of the century in France, a more settled political condition followed up the victory of Hugo Capet. This is the beginning of the Capetian dynasty in France. And Odo Cluny undertook to restore discipline and learning among his clergy drawing inspiration, perhaps, for some aspects of his reform from Irish traditions. And the movement rapidly spread in all directions. Uh, An interesting link there, Odo Odo of Cluny, in order to restore the traditions. It's not just learning that Cesare cites, but discipline, right? Discipline and learning as a dual factor. Otto repeated the well-worn charges against profane learning, but his Latin verses show that he did not act upon his own theories. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the lack of princely courts where men of learning could find refuge, protect, and the necessary encouragement might well have rendered fruitless all previous efforts if a progressive sovereign had not arisen in Saxony, where such an event seemed likely to occur. So if we're thinking of this from a Carlylean perspective, we've had the great men 
being the centers of of these learnings. So Charlemagne isn't the center of learning. Um, that came back down from Ireland and Northumberland, as certainly from a Latinist and Greek perspective. Think of Alcuin of York. But they still had to center, that learning had to be injected back into mainland Europe around a character like Charlemagne, around a figure, something had to embody that greatness. Um, so Charlemagne encompasses it, but then the decadence ensues after him, and now Cesare is thinking there has to be another figure around which the learning can crystallize. So we go to Saxony. Otto I, the Great, this is Otto the Great, added for, uh, to another great, you know, Charlemagne, Otto the Great. It's always going to be someone to moniker the Great or someone that invokes greatness when you think of Charlemagne, almost synonymous with it. Added to a circle and attracted to himself, attracted to himself, the best brains of France, Germany, and Italy. Even that phraseology by Cesare is something you wouldn't see today, that the greatness of the king attracts to himself the intellectual, right? So now, during 2020, what we've had is the rule of the, the experts, right? The epidemiologist or the virologist or the model maker and the uh, leaders uh, deferring decision-making almost to them. Uh, there's been some pushback, but barely any, right? A lot of deferring decision makers. Here, you, you would have the opposite. The learned men of the day, be it in the classical tradition and the transmission of the Roman legacy, still had to center on greatness. And the greatness was within and intrinsic to the characters themselves. So Otto the Great and Charlemagne, and they attracted it almost like gravity towards them. Here's some examples. Stephen of Novara, Gonzo Eckhart II, and Bernward of Hiddleston, who after the death of Otto II helped the Byzantine Empress Theophano to bring uh, up the youthful Otto III. So we've got uh, patronage from the Byzantine Empire to uh, inject more Greek learning and from a Roman perspective, but still Greek, into the West again. Schools sprang up in Saxony and Bavaria, where at Tergonze, the learned Frumont copied uh, in his own hand works of that of Horace, Cicero, Statius, Juvenal, and Perseus, also in Lorraine and, Fl and in Flanders. And it has been observed that few laymen had any part in this Saxon revival, but the clergy, who had an epoch so great a share in the management of civil, political affairs, that the movement did not exhaust itself in the seclusion of cells or affect only religious learning. No doubt pious texts and theological uh, books claimed the largest attention, but the classics were not ignored, since Roswitha, found occasion to decry the course of Terence and Rahing of Flavigny to copy the Aeneid. Latin learning did not penetrate the Saxon world so deeply as it had done the people of Britain. Le German legends, however, were rendered into Latin and topical poems were composed in Latin for a musical setting. Music had indeed a considerable share in this progressive movement. I always think of Germany as, a, as the land of classical music, right? Even, even one of the best composers who have ever uh, uh, have been around in England was still German of origin, Handel. And then uh, his contemporary, of course, is Bach. And then later we're going to get Wagner, we're going to get that almost perfection of stage and classical music and mythos uh, in Wagner. So the Germans are always quite a musical people. And, and also, if we think of Goethe and Winkelmann and the obsession with Greece and the Germans who saw themselves as inheritors of Greece far more than of Latin Rome, uh, we're seeing elements of that here too, where the English take up the Latin world far more readily than the Germans. So the topical poems of Latin, though, were still place in musical settings. So to get into the German mindset, you could say they needed to place these, the Latin language poems into a musical setting. Music had indeed a considerable share in this progressive movement, a fact which is but partly due to the German fondness for song. For Latin influence entered into musical studies. Gerbert has been hailed as the innovator of musical art, particularly because he succeeded in explaining the theories of Macrobius and Boethius uh, for the benefit you know, of the medieval world. And it was primarily due to the interpretation and dissemination of the information which he drew from Boethius and to his direct or indirect connection with Arab and Jew, Jewish scholars uh, 
of Spain that Gerbert became also the leader of a revival of scientific studies. Thus, there appears to have been scarcely any intellectual movement during the earlier Middle Ages, which was not closely dependent on Roman heritage. Just as a great fire resists the attempts of extinction, and after the principal outburst is checked, flares up, here and there in secondary blazes, the Latin civilization could not be stamped out. When Italy ceased to be its centre, there were indications of its persistence in Africa, in Spain, in Ireland, and from Ireland, the movement spread to Britain, from Ireland and Britain to France, to Germany, and back to Italy, and then from Germany and France, uh, from Germany to France and to Italy again. At last, towards the end of the 10th century, we find a more enduring revival throughout Europe. The improvement was no longer local and temporary, but general and continuous, and announced the dawn of scholasticism. Um, as we mentioned earlier, Aristotle being quite an important figure here. So we'll see what Cesare says about scholasticism as, we're, as we get into a more continuous revival. There were still the ecclesiastics of excessively mundane disposition, and there were countries in which the layman did not share the progressive learning. But even the most corrupt ecclesiastics were widely read in the classics. So much so that the fractious bishop of Etherius of Verona felt bound to justify himself for having cited and imitated too often the works of Virgil, Cicero, Seneca. Elsewhere, laymen vied with ecclesiastics in the pursuit of learning. In Germany, France, and Britain, wider knowledge was immediately followed by increased creative activity. In Italy, such a result was considerably delayed, but in the end, it took place there also. And before the year one, uh, ten, sorry, before the year one thousand A.D., Eugenius uh, Vulgarius of Naples was acquainted with Lucan, Horace, Virgil, Servius and many other authors and books, including Boethius' Institutio Arithmetica, showed himself to be a master of meter and ventured to employ metrical schemes which had ceased to be used since ancient days. Tendency peculiar to medieval culture became at this time increasingly apparent. The culture, which was Latin and closely linked to the church, was Catholic by definition and thus unaffected by national or racial uh, distinctions. This is not to be interpreted too strictly, for men did not cease to be men, nor racial and political prejudice to exercise their influence, but it would be difficult to point out such national characteristics in the culture of the centuries from 1000 to 1300. Just as men of all races flocked to the court of Charlemagne to place themselves under the guidance of Alcuin, and just as learned men who were born in France, England, and Italy joined the Germans whom the Ottos protected, so when the centers of study were formed, which developed by degrees into the great medieval universities. Students, teachers flocked to them from every part of Europe. So here we have a shift, right? The the center, the greatness around which the, the learneds, such as Alcuin, want to gather, that shifts over time, right? So by the time we've reached the scholasticism, they are gathering themselves at an institution called a university. And that's quite different to gathering at the court of a king. Of an emperor. The world of study was never more united and single minded than in the period of the schoolmen. It stood above national associations, a real universitas magistrorum, which uh, comprised the men of learning and science of every civilized country. Okay, and we can see in there an uh, idea of why universities, as this idea of this supranational body, have entered sort of a, a flavor of being so supranational now in the West that it's anything, it's everything but uh, Western themselves, right? They've gone so far into the ideal of being a universitas magistrorum that they, they don't even have their own core, which is you know, quite ironic. Of course, at this point, the whole idea of the supranational university body, this point being you know, 1200 scholasticism, is because the Latin revival needed something continuous that couldn't just sputter and then die out around courts of, of the kings themselves. It was not our purpose to outline a sketch of Latin culture during the Middle Ages. It suffices to have shown that there was no definite break of continuity in the tradition of culture from the 5th to the 11th century, that learning never became fully extinct, even in the most perilous, gory periods of strife. It had to seek shelter in successive migrations to different countries. Uh, the year 1000 provides a useful landmark, it was once an accepted tradition that men had been terrorized by fearful prediction which forecast the end of the world at that date. 
so that the daily expectation of a cataclysm had inflicted a daily repetition of the agonies of death. It is known now that they were men never preyed upon by such a terror, that they were never trembled at the thought of the year 1000, and thus were not spurred to new hopes and activity when the fatal date had gone by. But this legend may have a foundation in truth, or at least a symbolical value. The social and political conditions in Europe during the 10th century were terrible, for England the Chronicle is sufficient to evidence of it, and on the continent similar documents could easily be cited. The unceasing ravages which Normans, Arabs and Hungarians afflicted upon Europe may well have aroused in men a blank feeling of despair, no less crushing than the fabled expectation of the end of the world. After the year 1000, the political conditions did not suddenly improve, but the atmosphere became less disturbed. Studies in particular were pursued in a manner more methodical, owing to the activities of the schoolmen and other contemporary philosophers who cannot be classed, but must nevertheless be grouped with the schoolmen. Early in the Middle Ages, there had been men of keen perception who realized, dimly at their first and later more distinctly, that the barbarian invasions had brought about a serious decline in learning. This is, um, the, you know, the secondary decline, uh, the secondary darkness that inflicts, for instance, England between Alfred and Chaucer. Scholars who felt con competent to impart any teaching became more or less clearly conscious of a task which they could not fail to undertake, the savage, salvage of such fragments of knowledge as they had learned from the ancients. It is probably due to the impression and intentions that most of the authors seem to renounce specialization. So when you're under threat from enveloping darkness, you should renounce specialization, um, not proceed, because... The specialization, you could picture it this way, right? The specialization has gone on for so to such an extent that you no longer even know who your, who your immediate neighbors are in the context of the specialization. And you've lost all idea of what the shape of the whole organism is that, that you have specialized out from. Um, so in the Middle Ages, Cesare is saying there's an element of this that occurred. People realized this and renounced specialization and wrote the works of an encyclopedic character. On the threshold of the Middle Ages, Boethius and Cassiodorus endeavored to cram into their works large stores of information. So similar to, to them, he's, uh, Cesare here is saying Boethius and Cassiodorus in the 6th century uh, saw similar and hence wanted to store as much knowledge as they could into their own texts. Uh, you could say that's why there's such platonic um, Philosophic Stoic elements in Neoplatonic and Stoic elements in Boethius's Constellation of Philosophy. But there's also poetry in there, and there's also just the wanting the pure preservation of, of the Latin tongue in a, in a high art. So they wanted to cram in large stores of information. Later, Isidore of Seville and Gregory Tours and the Venerable Bede wrote about all branches of learning. Alcuin asserted that philosophy is naturarum inquisitorum nivinarum. Humanorum que cognitio quantum possible, but possible est omni est mare. Alcuin's pupil and plagiarist Rabinars Maurus, uh, at the beginning of the ninth century, compiled the great encyclopedia of the earlier medieval centuries called De Universo. And let us one, uh, note once more that all of them wrote in Latin and were only acquainted with Latin sources or with Greek works in Latin translations. There existed at the time some selections of Aristotle's Organon, translated by Marius Victorinus, and Boethius, Plato's Timaeus. Of course, we talk about uh, the natural transmission of Plato. The most natural transmission of Plato is his Timaeus. It's always there, and it's why um, in Raphael's School of Athens, if you see the text that Plato's holding is the Timaeus, because that would have been the one that passed through, um, largely, I think, due to Porphyry, in the Neoplatonic, wrote a, wrote a wrote some notes on the Timaeus, just seen as an introduction to the text. Explained by Chalcidius in a way that rendered an accurate interpretation possible, the outlines of other Platonic and Neoplatonist works were known through the treaties of St. Augustine. There was also the Isagoge of Porphyrius, translated by Marius Victorinus, and further, Macrobius, Mimertus, Donatus, some of Cicero's works, Virgil, Ovid, Horace, Seneca, Juvenal, Lucan. Uh, all of these are discussed by Har uh, Horace's complete core. And then maybe less core, we get Claudian, Vitruvius is the architect, and Vegetius, who um, must be of lesser note, Hyatt doesn't mention him much. 
If you read rhetorical books, the Latin and some of the Greek fathers and Latin renderings, and later the works of the pseudo Dionysius Areopagite, uh, translated by Jan Scotus, John uh, Gregory the Great, Isidore, Bede, Marcianus Capella. A few additions, including a number of spurious books, would complete the list of the most common sources, the usefulness of which was further impaired by the amazing mistaken attributions. It has been mentioned already that the intellectual activity of the 10th century was centered on single individuals in isolated schools, Otto at Cluny, Popo at Fulda, and then Rathirius, Liutbrand, Notker, Gunzo. Gunzo was among the most interesting figures, being a layman in the company of ecclesiastics, and thus an outstanding representative that lay education, which amazed Otto of uh, Freisingen. He showed a pugnacious and punctiliousness that was later, unfortunately, to be the frequent heritage of the humanists. So what's Cesare getting there? A pugnacious and punctiliousness. <laughs> I think it's a good little mix. Um, frequentist of the humanists. Well, yeah. Good way of thinking of someone who was like battle-hardened and wanting that wit about them cutting you could say. But Gerbert is by far the greatest of all his contemporaries. His intellect was so insatiable, he wished to know everything knowledgeable. And so exceptionally, <laughs> good luck in uh, the 21st century. I do try, uh, but uh, I wonder what Gerbert would have made of it all. And so exceptionally powerful that he reached conclusion almost by divination, arguing from data uh, that would have been insufficient for most men. At last, towards the end of the 10th and the beginning of the following century, there came on stage another strange representative lay scholarship, Anselm of Besate and St. Anselm of Iosta from De Wolf, calls the first schoolmen. The rise of scholasticism renders a later process of transmission of the Roman heritage too simple to need explanation for the philosophers who were described as schoolmen of a common minimum of doctrine and knowledge besides methods and tendencies of interpreting it. Um, were proper to each, but the schoolmen were particularly linked to one another by a fundamental conception of culture. Truth, according to them, was not a personal possession discovered by uh, independently by each philosopher. It was a treasure that had to be handed down from generation to generation, each generation increasing its preciousness by adding further discoveries. And I think that's a very good way of putting what should be uh, the idea of university, right? That the truth exists, uh, you're handing down the truth, and it's been handed down to you as well. You, you haven't just come up with a conceptualized truth out of a box, and then you must pass it down, make your own incursions, make your own little dents or increases into it, the shape of this truth, and then you hand it over, um, rather than you entering in and coming up with this brand new truth regime. Thus the transmission, so in that extent, yes, I agree with the schoolmen. Whether I agree with what their idea of truth was, perhaps, you know, in in the course of 800 years, you can still be of that tradition, but the hand-me-downs and the tweaks can be such that you you have evolved from it. Um, But I I wouldn't want to see a rupture from the schoolmen or to say that they got everything wrong, you know, which is probably... How many people in, in the humanities today would even consider that as, as an idea, that you're still inheriting the schoolman tradition, which has gone through the transmission of Rome, like what Cesare here has, has told us. This transmission is as much as survived of ancient culture as understood by the schoolmen, the natural function of scholarship. So <laughs> to Cesare, writing in the 1920s, so he was talking about something that happened 800 years earlier and was still saying, yes, this passing through generation to generation of this idea of truth, which you tweak or you harness, was the whole idea of scholarship. Uh, It was the function of it. Um, He was able to look back 800 years and still come out with that idea, whereas now, somewhat 80 years later, um, or maybe almost 100 years later at this point, we, we just... We feel more detached from Cesare than he did from the schoolmen of of the uh, 12th century. Uh, They were no longer distressed, as were Jerome or Gregory of Tours, by a dramatic conflict between inborn love of learning and a conception of Christianity, which rendered every profane knowledge abominable. The recurrence 
So the purity, the that original purity spiral of Christianity has sort of died out, and now they could try and fuse them more readily, the the Christianity with the the ancient learnings, right? That that had preceded Christianity. The recurrence of such a contrast among the schoolmen was rare and sporadic. No doubt the more important questions which were debated by them concerned philosophy, such as the question of universals. No doubt scholastic philosophy tended in its development to identify itself with theology. No doubt the schoolmen did not abate the medieval claim of encyclopedic knowledge, but the great intellectual activity was caused by scholastic philosophy, particularly by the feverish search after truth, it had a very great influence on all branches of learning. John of Salisbury, in the introduction of his Metalogicus, uh, inveighed against a typical reactionary who still contrasted religious duty with profane learning. But by this time, his contest had already been won. Scholastic learning had reached its fullness and was incomparably broader in extent and deeper in appreciation than it had been for centuries. First, the contact with the Arabic and Jewish schools of Spain, then the relations with the Byzantine and Oriental world, continuing with the Crusades and reaching their climax in 1204 with the capture of Constantinople, and lastly, the intercourse with Eastern philosophers, which took a, a place at the court of Frederick II, had been and were to be of invaluable assistance to progress. The mention there of the date 1204 and the capture of Constantinople is an interesting one. Um, of course, the Crusades is what Spengler, in his decline and fall of the West, says is the, the great expansionary age of Faustian civilization. Uh, and, it, and others have also commented that it is the great, it, it, it's the, the true collapse of the Byzantine civilization, right? It limps on thereafter all the way till 1453, but there's such a rupture uh, after that, that crusade that really the lifeblood had gone out of the Byzantines. So, interesting juxtaposition here. Cesare almost writes of it as if it's collateral damage, right? What happens to the Byzantines is collateral damage. 1204 is a great date uh, of re-emergence of the West. Uh, I would be skeptical. I think there, there was certainly an, an element of barbarism still in the West there, and the way they treated uh a place like Constantinople, when they encountered it and sieged and took it, I, d I don't think it was of the you know one of the proudest moments of anyone from Western Europe. Uh, and perhaps there was far more destruction in that event than there was learning or knowledge taken back from universities. But nevertheless, it's an interesting way that that Cesare here does not seem to look at that date um, as as anything damning. The 12th century prepared by tireless labors the triumph of scholasticism in the 13th century. The first stimulus came from the discovery and translation into Latin of more works of Aristotle, who had been known so far merely as a dialectician. The ultimate perfection was rendered possible by Albertus Magnus and achieved by Thomas Aquinas. By then, the most, uh, both the Dominican and Franciscan orders had been founded and they became, during the 13th century, the moving spirits of the oldest universities, taking the lead which the Benedictines had held hitherto. It was in the 13th century that the very learned Robert Gross Testa showed that he had enough Greek to translate works written in that language at a time when few knew any Greek outside the Byzantine Emperor, Empire and Basilian monasteries. It was then also that Roger Bacon forestalled later discoveries by his miraculous intuitions of the principles of science, and Meister Eckhart inaugurated German mysticism. It's already an interesting duality there between German mysticism and, you know, Baconian empiricism almost, a, a proto-empiricism emerging in the UK, or in England and Britain as it were at the time. Um which would have chased all the way down to Foligno's time. And of course, before that, when I think you've got Emerson talking about how his high noon is, of the one of the, uh, is that of England and the scientific sensations, and then his night is that of Germany and the mystical dreams. Um, a paraphrase, of course. But that duality was, was clearly there, and they could trace it back from the 1920s all the way back to this scholastic outbreak. Um, just an interesting continuity, continuity point between how one perceives the elite literary 
um, class and the intellectual class of England against that of Germany. Philosophy began at the epoch to acquire national characteristics just as arts were becoming nationalized. Legacy had been passed down to the modern world. Modern uh, thought, however, did not succeed for a long time and went in part only in freeing itself from medieval influences. Already during the 11th century, the discovery of some forgotten classical works had rendered more complex the relations with ancient thought, and they soon acquired entirely new forms. Gonzo's pride and pugnacity, John of Salisbury's admiration for and imitation of Cicero's style, the almost humanistic tendencies of the Paduan group of poets who called Lovato their master, had all been an indication of new spirit which was stirring. It was not for many years that Richard of Berry started to collect books with the ardor of bibliomaniac. And Petrarch led the way of, um, in a venture, some rediscovery of ancient thought, thus laying the foundation of Italian philosophy, as Master uh, Meister Eckhart forecast the German and Roger Bacon English philosophical tendencies. The moderns were no longer satisfied with what ancient learning had been assimilated and elaborated by medieval thought. They endeavoured to establish a direct connection with the classics by ignoring the Middle Ages, the direct Roman heritage, however small it was, which had been the power stimulus, became more oppressive when it had grown larger and proved a mixed blessing by stunting originality in those countries where the movement of the Renaissance was strongest. So stultification, it grows larger and then, and then it stultifies. You could picture that being something solidifying, but it's also kind of a, st a stultifying and it's a ceasing of the movement of, of the, the growth of learning. So there's Spenglerian thought here that uh, in Cesare that you know growth of learning has does have its flowering and, and solidification, possibly its fossilization or else its um, decay. But uh, he's not quite there on on the Spenglerian mold. It's just the same sort of idea of incurring a morphology into uh, an intergenerational culture. But he's not quite talking about civilization in the same manner. There is a sign by which the attitude of scholars and groups of scholars towards the ancient world may be sure, most surely traced. With few exceptions, the learned literature of the Middle Ages was all written in Latin. And medieval men of letters assailed themselves with that language as a maximum uh, of freedom. And it was a spoken language for them. They had used it in teaching and debating. They thought in Latin and thus adapted to all the requirements of their thoughts, feeling free from all puristic preoccupations. So Latin as sort of the great remover from the humdrum day to day. Only those scholars who accepted and who lived far from Roman centers, such as Venerable Bede, were more readily attracted to imitating the classical style. More often, uh, polish was understood as complexity or obscurity, and mostly it was not sought, sought at all. There developed as a result a coin dialectos, kind of lingua franca of medieval thought best example of which may be recognized in the remarkably perspicuous language uh, which was used by Thomas Aquinas. These scholars wrote uh, just as they thought, being only preoccupied with their object of making their meaning intelligible. When one of them imitated the style of a favorite Latin author, it may be assumed that either he was a solitary exception or that he was influenced by some of the circumstances which brought about the refinement of the Renaissance. But such exceptions are rare. For there were but few who recognized their own inferiority in writing Latin, or who compared to the Coyon de Electos to Augustan models and found it wanting as a means of expression. These were purists, for whom Latin was no longer a language of common usage, as it had been uh, for their contemporaries, a uh, common and thus almost living language, but an artificial means of cultivated thought, a dead language, which could be imitated from classical models could no longer be enlivened by new developments. Modern nations were formed from the direct influence of Roman thought and was exercised without interference. Okay, this is you know, Cesare's idea of natural transmission. The humanistic return to the ancient sources took place when the structure of modern nations had already hardened. Each of them took to herself that portion of the new discoveries which she wished or was able to take. But the direct heritage was not apportioned in the same manner. All the peoples of Western Europe, whatever their political vicissitudes happened to be, between the 5th and 9th centuries formed by degrees a cultural unit, which remained one and inseparable up to the 13th century. 
To such a development, all races contributed to their share until Schoolman of Paris gave the absolute leadership to France. Later, the different nations ceased, uh, hence again why Hyatt would, would call France the Middle Age country that we need to know in terms of the classical tradition, right? That's where the schoolman had solidified in, in the University of Paris. So it's it's it, he doesn't even talk about the University of uh, Paris, Hyatt doesn't. But it's interesting that Cesare independently comes to the same conclusion when talking about the schoolmen. So even though, you know, Hyatt is thinking more purely in a lit literary form, Romance of the Rose, um, the, the, the insertion of romantic elements into the history of Troy, uh, whereas Cesare is thinking of the schoolmen, and and the uh, twinning of maybe Aristotelian philosophy with Christianity and so on. Uh, it's still that they're they both agree that the center of the cultural influence is in France. Many of the different nations cease to have an instinctive feeling of the common origins of their civilization. Other influences, and particularly national tendencies, were at work. So there came a time when the possible to mistake the movement of the Renaissance for the principal cause of Latin influence. But if one wishes to have a ready standard by which to evaluate the importance of the heritage or test by means with which to trace the different processes of transmission and their relative efficiency, one needs only to ask a few simple questions. What would have been the fate of Europeans if the thought of the Romans had not existed and had not become masters of the world? How great would have been the disaster if the barbaric peoples had been allowed to begin their devastations five or six centuries earlier? And they had not met on their way the enormous and massive structure of Roman civilization. Such questions open out possibilities so terrifying that one dares not venture to press them. But we might find another question, less difficult to answer. What would have been the worst, uh, what would have been the course of Western civilization if the men of the Renaissance had not endeavored to suppress medieval culture by superimposing upon it the revived culture of the ancients? Perhaps some would have found to reply that those nations that appear to have been more fortunate in the modern age experienced less deeply the influence of the Renaissance. It would be an unpardonable overstatement to affirm that the modern age has received a large share of legacy of Rome by natural transmission than it had acquired from the Renaissance. But it would be no less inaccurate to fail to recognize that a considerable portion of that which the men from the Renaissance did find and accept had already reached them however modified, by direct transmission, and that they were enabled to carry out their own discoveries thanks to that which had been taught them by the Middle Ages.